I think that if your child is bored, it's not at all your child's fault. It really is the responsibility of the child's therapist to make the changes so that the motivation is there. But I think that it is also really important to keep in mind that what we are asking our kids to do in therapy is really, really hard. And that sometimes we're asking them to do this really hard thing multiple times a week. So you can really understand, I think, why there might be a fluctuation in motivation from one session to the next, or sometimes even within a session, motivation might change. Um, one thing that I had um, experienced with my son is that he was really shutting down in therapy. And so when it comes to looking at children and their engagement um, level in therapy and are they bored or what's going on in that situation, I would urge you to look a little bit at, is it is it less bored? Them and more shutting down because it's hard <laughs> or because they might just not want to be there. Um, I know, especially, you know, at the younger ages is when he did that, you know, it was just something that we really struggled with. It was something that we had to really work together as a team with the speech pathologist to really make, you know, make it comfortable for him. And there is always a reason to why this child may be bored in therapy. It may be that they are not interested in the activity you have. They may not want to do that word when you've come into the room. They may have come in having an argument with mom and dad before they even entered the therapy room. I think one of the most important things to do along with that is to not make it this negative of, I know that this is a boring thing to do, but you have to do it. Because if you as the parent are labeling it as boring as well, um, that's just going to reinforce that notion in the child. So reframe the situation. Like, oh my goodness, you get to go see Miss Denise today. I wonder what you guys will play with. Is there something exciting that you're wanting to do with her? Maybe we can bring this in and see if there's a way that we can you can play with it with her at, you know, whatever it is. So this seems like a great opportunity for uh, for a huddle up or for a conversation with the therapist. Um, and as a therapist, I would want a family to bring this concern to me so that we could address it. Um, as a parent, I would want to know that um, the clinician that, I, that you're working with is taking your concern seriously and that um, the clinician is demonstrating some flexibility um, in being able to adjust how things are going. I think that the most important thing is finding a way to talk to the therapist about amping up the fun factor. Maybe for a little bit, we back off a little bit and allow the child to just come and feel like they're in charge a little bit more and doing something that's super fun because, you know, our kids are going to school and learning. They're working on talking all day long and it's hard for them there may be something social going on. So, and this is another way of them saying like, hey, everything is too much for me, right? And so um, having an open dialogue with a therapist and always just making it, I know that today it's hard to get out there and do this, but it's, you always have so much fun with Miss Denise. You always come out laughing. So let's remember that and have a good day. Make him also have successes. Um, that's one thing I do think is important that when we're asking someone to do something that's really hard to make sure that we're throwing some things in there that they are successful at. So they start feeling good about that and they're not only being asked to do hard things. Um, just making sure that the therapy is child age specific. Um, a lot of people, you know, say my child is just, you know, they're not good at sitting still. Well, that is, you know, very common. And so making sure that our therapy is appropriate for the age level, you know, we wouldn't necessarily expect a two-year-old to be able to sit at a table and, and do a lot of drill work as easily as a child who's older. And so making sure that, you know, we're using play-based therapy, that we're letting the child be active if they need to learn and, and grow while being active, that's okay. It doesn't have to look a certain way of sitting at a table, for instance. I've also found some success in peer um, involvement or peer influence. For example, we allowed our sibling to go to therapy before. Um, that was really fun for him. And uh, same with that school. You know, we, we did a few group sessions and it almost seemed like he was more motivated to go. And so he got to be kind of the 
more seasoned child who was who's teaching the newer kid to therapy to go down for school therapy and I think that really made him feel like a leader and he felt really important in that in that specific situation and so sometimes I do think um, you know groups isn't always bad it's a peer influence you know they get they get motivated to do things by seeing peers do it um, differently than they would from mom and dad um, so I think that's important. So some ideas for suggestions to discuss might be seeing how you can include your child's interests. You might want to look at the words that the therapist is targeting. The target words have probably been picked to support the production of a variety of syllable shapes or movement patterns. However, not all words are motivating for kids to say. Perhaps putting together a list of really motivating words like the names of a pet, the name of a sibling, favorite foods, favorite characters from TV or YouTube, and asking whether some of them can be incorporated into the practice. I've personally incorporated words like YouTube or skippity toilet because these are motivating for the child to say and they target the goals that I have for the clients. I never would have chosen these targets on my own but I incorporate them because they're meaningful and motivating. It may also be helpful to talk to your therapist about the kinds of activities or toys that your child likes to play with. Therapy for CAS does require a lot of repetition and drill, but if your child can work towards something that is motivating, like watching a video or making a marble tower, you might get more buy-in and motivation. You could ask your therapist for ways to use different modalities to make the sessions a little different each time. If your child likes movement, you can incorporate some more active times away from the therapy table during the session, or incorporating music or other sensory activities might be enough to increase engagement. One thing that I did with a child to actually change it up is I actually changed the entire environment. So I turned the therapy room into a birthday party and surprised this little girl without her even knowing what was going on because she had such a big love for Bluey. We also did Pass the Parcel, where I would have that element of surprise. And this can go for any kid. They love the element of surprise. So taking the things that they're motivated, but surprising them and hiding them in eggs, in wrapping paper, in boxes, in cups that they can punch. Um, just doing fun, different activities. Another final idea might be to discuss some ways to give your child a little bit more control. This absolutely does not mean that your child should run the session, but sometimes offering a little bit of control allows your child to feel like they have some agency and provides the motivation to practice. This could be as simple as giving your child a choice between two activities or a choice of what target they want to work on first. I find that giving a little bit of control can do wonders for buy-in. Especially with older children, um, if there's complaints of boredom or, oh, do I have to do this again? Or how long do I have to do this? Um, I see that as an invitation for uh, collaboration. And let's bring this child into the conversation. Um, let's practice negotiation. Let's make a contract. Let's talk about what uh, responsibility each person has and uh, kind of be a little bit more overt with what the expectations are um, rather than kind of just drawing it out. Um, and I found that be helpful in two ways. Some kids, uh, we do refer back to the contract that we've set or the agreement that we've made. Hey, you said this, this, and this, and here we are, we're doing it. Um, uh, but for other kids, it's, it's more that um, having been brought into that conversation, they kind of have their personhood acknowledged and feel like, okay, this is someone who cares about how I'm doing in this uh, environment. And because of that, um, yeah, I have just a little bit more energy to, to go on with something that might not be the most motivating for them. We need to remember though, that while it is important to include activities that are motivating, this should not be at the expense of the number of opportunities that your child has to practice. The activity should not take away from the reason that your child is there, which really is to say as many targets as possible during the therapy time. The most important thing that we have to remember is that while we do want to make it fun, therapy has to be conscious practice. So while we take those moments and we have fun with them, we need to put that toy activity away 
And we want them to watch our mouths because that is when we're really getting the most bang for our buck, but still doing it through ways that they enjoy, whether it's painting their nails, whether it's putting stickers on our faces, whether it is doing ring toss. I've played the floor is lava in therapy before, but switch up the environment and make it fun. But the element of surprise is the number one key. Another thing that I found um, is that after about a year of working weekly with a child and a family, things do get a bit stale. Like that is an expectation that I have having worked with kids and families for a while. It, it, and and it's, um, it's something that happens at the fault of no one, um, that I have so many games and toys and ideas and jokes uh, that, that can kind of keep us going. But there is a, a, a kind of natural end to that. Um, and that it's something that we talk about when we start therapy, that, that this is a, a short term burst of therapy. We're going to address these things. We're going to try to do as much work on them as possible. And the expectation uh, might not be that we're going to um, get to everything, but we're going to do as much as we can. And then we're going to pass the ball off to somebody else who can kind of continue and, and, and run with it. And I've seen that work for kids uh, again and again, both uh, in getting uh, some kids who have been working for a long time with other clinicians and also in passing kids to others. Um, that, that, tri that, uh, that change or that refresher can be really helpful when that, that boredom does, uh, does set in a little bit. If the therapist were to be a little bit more by the book or we're going to do it this way and a child needs to fit into my system in order for this to happen, um, you just might not have the, the best fit for, for what your kid needs. Um, if they are complaining about being bored or how it's not working for them. Um, so I would hope that a conversation could solve a lot of this. Um, and I also recognize that maybe jumping from one clinician to another is a luxury that some have where others don't. Um, so that, you know, there is some nuance there that, that certainly needs to be considered. So these are just a few ideas to support your conversation with your therapist. The majority of therapists would be happy to problem solve through these issues with you and work together to develop a plan. Balancing motivation with the drill work and repetition that is required can be a challenge, but it's definitely possible to motivate while targeting these goals. Sometimes it just takes some creativity and thinking outside of the box.